بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Welcome audience to another episode of the Talking Dean podcast. I'm your host Majid and today I have with me uh, my co-host brother JK. Assalamu alaikum. And another special guest all the way from Bilad al-Sham, brother Toki Sharif aka Brother Tox. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for us to have you on this podcast, bro. Um, so yeah. before we start, there's a rumor. I heard a rumor that uh, you two brothers know each other. Yeah, we went to uni. Uh, we went to uni together. Uh, I remember talks. We were all confused back then. But um, I do remember some conversations, deep, deep conversations with Tox. We were, even from back then, I think uh, Tox really wanted to make a change, do something. Oh. We, we would go into... I don't know whether you remember talks, but like conversations about, you know, what's our purpose? How can we help the Ummah? How do we help the plight of the Ummah and stuff like that? But yeah, no, it's yeah. just Yeah, subhanAllah, um, what would I say? University is an uh, interesting period <laughs> in any, anybody's life, put it that way. And uh, what I would say is that I've always been a 100, 100% or nothing kind of person. So if I'm doing something, you know, if it's, if it's good, then inshallah, it's, Business I'll be really, really good. And if I'm doing something bad, then a stuff for Allah then it's you know, well I forgive me, it'll be really, really bad. So that's always the way my personality's been is that, you know, I'll I'll give it hundred percent. I've always been like uh, highly opinion opinionated. <coughs> Some people say headstrong. So yeah, in uni I had uh, my fair share of antics. Some of them I'd like to forget, inshallah ta'ala, but um the, the days with the ISOC, you know, towards the end of my time in uni was, was good. Alhamdulillah, I benefited from a lot of brothers there. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, no, all of us, obviously, we, we have to, we're really confused at that stage, isn't it, in terms of what our life is and, and what, what our purpose is. But Alhamdulillah, I think, uh, yeah, it shapes us as well. So, yeah, I remember you were a passionate brother, always, always loved having the conversations with you. Uh, and that brother Hanif, Hanif, I was mentioning yesterday to you, uh, the other brother, brother um, Hanif, is it? Yeah, he was the, he's the one who introduced me to you actually. He's a really good brother, mashallah. So, yeah, so I do know him much uh, from a yani, while ago, but it's been a while. Yani, Subhanallah, mentioning the brother Hanif, yani, um, I would say university definitely made me, obviously, because I'm from London and I went and lived up in, in Nottingham, uh, living alone, you know, coming from a Pakistani family and then, you know, going out into the big world by yourself, having no rules, sort of thing. Um, of course, that has its uh, positives and its negatives. Um, so I, I definitely look back at that and say, Alhamdulillah, that was a, was a blessing. It definitely made me uh, who I am today. It was an important part of my, my learning. Um, but in regards to Brother Hanif, subhanahu, I think that definitely on your journey in life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you certain people. And uh, I believe that he was one of those people. I've lost contact with him now. But one of the things that really, how can I say, uh, inspired me about him was the fact that he was a revert, brother originally of Jamaican heritage and he was living out there in, 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 in Nottingham with us, but he was subhanAllah very firm on his deen. And when I looked at him and I said, subhanAllah, this brother, he's Muslim. None of his, the rest of his family is Muslim. They've kicked him out of his home. He's been dis disowned for the beliefs that he holds today. And mashallah, look at him, how firm he is and how he's, you know, holding to the rules, you know, of, of the religion. And look at me, someone who's born Muslim, comes from a Pakistani family. I'm not praying my salah properly and I'm messing around and I'm doing all sorts of stuff that I shouldn't. Uh, and I, I looked at him and I thought, subhanAllah, this is something, you know. Yeah. And he started, imagine, imagine from being someone who wasn't Muslim, he started giving me da'wah. He started giving me da'wah and talking to me and telling me about deen yeah. and, you know, that was, that was very inspiration, inspirational for me and that yeah. had a big impact on a, on a change on me. Yeah, alhamdulillah, like, to be fair, um, a lot of Reverb brothers, the, the ones that, are, you know, really want to make that change and they recognise that they've got this gift from Allah that they've, you know, been given the truth. So they sometimes put us to shame because we've taken it, our deen for granted and, uh, you know, really just inherited it from our parents. So often we don't re recognise what it really means to be a slave of Allah. And the Reverb brothers, alhamdulillah, they do show us often how, how to really worship Allah subhanAllah. So, no, definitely. He, he, he introduced me to loads of brothers. So, you were one of them, but he, he was 
he was on the scene to be honest. He, he tried to help and, anyone he could. So alhamdulillah, may Allah, may Allah reward him. I mean, and this is what it is. Like, I, I'm going to say something probably controversial. People picked me up on it before. I believe even though I was born Muslim, I don't actually believe that I was really Muslim. I believe that I just inherited it. It was cultural. You know, I remember sometimes younger family would say, go read namaz, you know, go upstairs, throw water on ourselves, pretend I've done wudu, come back down and say, yeah, yeah, dad, I prayed, I prayed, you know what I mean? So that was, that was because we didn't understand. We were just taught, okay, you got to pray five times a day, you know, you got to go to the masjid, you got to learn to read Quran and stuff, whatever. But I didn't really understand. It's not until I went to uni and I went on this journey of comparative religion, speaking to, you know, people from different religions. Even, even you know, when I was in uni, I used to go to a Bible class there. I used to go to a Bible class. I, I used to talk to the Buddhists. Um, so I went on this journey of exploring every religion, looking for the truth, and then finally coming back to Islam and saying, wow, this really is the truth. Yeah, I think that's we all need to go through that process because, like you said, it is often a culture. So we've just inherited it from our parents, and do we do it because our dad tell, told us to do it, for example? But um, we went through it. Myself. I don't know about you, Maj, but I think I can personally say I went through the same process. Uh, I didn't go to a, a Bible class. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't do that. But um, I definitely went through the questions in life and asking, "What's my purpose? Is it really true? Why is Islam the true religion? Why are the others wrong?" Um, and going through that process really makes you strong in your deen and you actually look to Islam as, a, as, as the truth and as a benefit rather than just accepting it as something that my dad told me to do or my mum told me to do. So alhamdulillah, yeah, I think all of us, all of us, it's not, it's not a shame to say that. At all. I, I, think, I, think, I think sometimes the problem is it's a cultural thing. It's a shame for people to say, oh, I don't really believe or ask. You know, even we face it here in Syria. There's some people, they don't know the basic tenets of Islam. But they will say they're Muslim. Mm. Um, so it's like someone that makes, for example, kufr here and curses Allah or curses the Prophet. They have this in the culture here. Some of the low, low castes here, they do this. Do you really believe in Islam if you're going to curse Allah? No, you know, so. that's a, that's a, yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, but if you ask that person, are you Muslim? They say, yeah, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Do you understand? So it's one of those things where unfortunately a lot of people, they are afraid to embrace that question and say, actually, wait a minute, what is it I actually believe? And why am I believing in it? And ask the questions. And I think, I think for us as Pakistanis, one of the things that we face is there's a big generation gap between the generation that came and settled in the UK mm. and then those of us that were born in the UK, um, different mindsets. And, you know, for example, most Pakistani youngsters of our generation, I don't think they'd ever be able to speak about, you know, sex education with their parents and stuff like this. Um, and now this is something that's a really important topic in the UK, especially with all this LGBTQ. I think it's wajib for parents to be speaking to their children about these issues. Mm. But how many Pakistani, you know, aunties and uncles can you imagine talking to their children about <laughs> these issues? Um, so I think these are some of the, the reasons why, you know, we suffer as, as a, as a ummah. Um, yani one of the things that I would say, and maybe this is not connected, but I feel it's connected is when I was in prison in Israel, mm. one of the things that I saw from the Zionists and even from the youth was that they really believe in the Zionist state of Israel. You know, unfortunately we say we want Khilafah and we want Al-Aqsa and we want this and that, but you don't see it in the action. You mm. just, it's just empty words. But when I went there, I was in prison and I saw all of the, the youth in the military, the conscripts, um, the way that they were physically trained. And it, they were bringing 16, 17 year olds. We were in prison in Beersheba and they were coming and they were talking to us, speaking fluent English, discussing, you know, topics with us, trying to get into our minds, etc., etc. But they, one thing that was common about them is that they had a belief, you know, they were 100% activated in helping their community and I think that's somewhere where we lack as a as a community yeah yeah definitely yeah I mean the thing is, is obviously a lot of it you know it's a disconnection from the Quran because if you look at the Quran itself Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know it's all about rational arguments Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't just saying look you need to blindly follow you know he tells us to you know observe the reality observe creation and conclude that there's a creator but you know like Brother Tox is saying as well is you know when you're younger you know, you, you wouldn't feel comfortable going to a relative and say, listen, you know, 
is there really a hereafter? Because you, you get a slap and say, Astaghfirullah, man, you know, you know, I'm going to tell your dad. You know, I mean, it's just something you want to do. You know, and the thing is, is that uh, you guys make a valid point because the problem is, is that if we're not speaking about these things, right now the Qufar, their, their arms are wide open. You understand? And, and the thing is that if, and that's why it's very important that Muslim parents, they understand their deen because really now as well, with all this LGBT or science and stuff, you know, when, when the kids come home and they ask these questions, if the parents can't answer the questions or they give some sort of wishy-washy cultural type of answer, you know, these kids now be, you know, they're growing up in the academic uh, arena. So to them, you know, they think this doesn't make sense. And then when they go and speak to the teachers and they start giving them all the information, that's when you can lose the kids, you know, and, um, and that's right in, in the West, right? Obviously there's an issue of this gender fluidity. And so for, the reality is, is right now, there's even a challenge of the Iman itself, you know, we, we need to secure the Iman of the youth. Um, well, subhanAllah, uh, let, let, let's, let's move on because I know Brother Tox spoke about the issue to do with uh, him being in prison and stuff like that. And we'll definitely come on to that because I, I wasn't aware that that was the case. But what I want to do is, uh, what me and JK were thinking is, you know, at the moment we've got a lockdown, uh, everyone in the UK and, uh, you know, people are finding it difficult that they can't visit their parents and they can't visit their relatives or pray tarawih and stuff like this. And obviously this is something new, it's unprecedented and it's something which, you know, uh, we find strange. But at the same time, what I've noticed is that um, even though this has happened, we've become, uh, we've become very, uh, we're looking very inwards. I.e. the fact that it just seems like now that our problems here, the fact that we can't do these things has become like our biggest concern. And that's why we thought, you know what, Let, let's get, you know, let's try to uh, broaden the horizon for Muslims because at the end of the day, you know, uh, what, two, three months ago, you know, the news was all about Syria, about, you know, the, the campaign against Idlib and stuff like this. And it was on the news. But the fact that that's not on the news now, uh, a lot of Muslims, the way we've become is that, you know, we are, the headlines dictate what we talk about. So if they're speaking about uh, Kashmir, we'll speak about Kashmir. If they're speaking about Syria, we'll speak about Syria. You know, and right now with all this COVID-19 issue, people have maybe lost the fact that, you know, what's actually happening in the Ummah. So, you know, we've got a few inconveniences, I would say. I would call it purely inconvenience that we're experiencing here. But Brother Tox, what's the situation in... Um, I mean, I'm not going to say what's, what's the lockdown in Syria because that would be an insult on itself. But what's the situation with all this COVID-19 and stuff like that in Syria? Um, to be honest, uh, it's a, a very, very uh, unique and interesting situation. Um, surprisingly, um, Corona has made the whole world go crazy. But given Syria and the people of Syria some kind of respite. Um, and how long this is going to last, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But this is maybe from the hikmah of you know, the most gracious, the most merciful. Um, right now, there's currently no reported cases of corona uh, in Syria. And we're kind of besieged. So we are on a lockdown. We don't have free borders. We can't go uh, in and out as we uh, want to. So you have to understand that maybe that in itself has been one of the reasons why it's helped because there isn't this free movement of people coming in and out. Maybe that's one of the reasons why corona hasn't come. But at the same time, um, if Corona was to hit, we're worried. We're, we've started to put preparations in place. Um, and the reality is the health services here cannot handle an outbreak like Corona. Um, right now, the area that I'm in, uh, Idlib, all of it is around 6 million people. Where I am closer to the borders is about 4 million people. And you got to understand the situation in the refugee camps, it's impossible for them to do social distancing. There's no such thing as social distancing mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so it's a, it's a very difficult situation. We make dua that it doesn't come. And on a final note, one of uh, my sheikhs here, he said something very interesting. He said the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that, mm -hmm. um, and the hadith is da'if, by the way, so it's a weak hadith, but they say there could be some kind of uh, 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 moral from it. The, um, they say the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, la uh, la fi safe. So there is no, uh, there will be no pandemic or epidemic. Allah will not send a pandemic or epidemic to a place of war. So the Shaykh was saying that, subhanAllah, this hadith, so, so far, 
seems to be true because if you look at Yemen, if you look at Gaza, if you look at Syria where we are now, Bilal al-Sham, alhamdulillah, um, Corona hasn't come. Is that the reason? Allah knows best, but we really hope so that inshallah, that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting us from this because it would be very devastating. You know, we've already started to think about how we're just going to bury people. Um, the facilities would be very difficult just to handle, you know, burying people. Um, the hospitals, I think there's only 50 ventilators in the whole of Idlib for 6 million people. So you've got to understand that that's, that's, that's nothing. So if major superpowers have been crippled by corona, what is it going to do to, to, to us, a place where there's no government? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's amazing how it has an impact on Syria and the whole world. Major countries have been impacted. But um, like you said, inshallah, that it doesn't happen because I can't imagine when you look at the, you know, some of the drone footage, even some of the drone footage you've taken, actually, you look at the refugee camps and they're literally, subhanAllah, they're like sardines in the sense that there's no space at all. So if it ever started to spread there, it would spread like wildfire. And, um, you know, and people, like you said, there would be no social distancing and there would be no uh, support in terms of ventilation and, and hospital support. So um, pray that it doesn't happen. Um, but what do you think, what's the, pe what's the uh, sentiment of the people? Are they worried or do they feel, because of the war and what they've already gone through, is it something that in, in respect of being bombed, actually is not that big a difference? Um, obviously it would be a calamity, but um, they've been through so much calamity, you know, they're not worried about that anymore. What, what's you, the perception? You want, you, want, you want the honest answer? Basically... <laughs> We basically we do a lot of uh, awareness stuff here to do with hygiene and making sure people are clean and you know you know even even when it comes to you know how to do wudu correctly and these kind of things. One of the funny things there's like a running joke right now. They they're saying that don't worry if Corona comes to Syria, Corona is gonna die. The Syrian people are not gonna die. Corona will die. <laughs> that's, that's 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 what they that's the jokes that they make. You know so. Alhamdulillah, it just, you know, shows, shows the will of the people in Syria, Alhamdulillah, that, that, you know, they can go through it all. They've been through so much that nothing, nothing will stop them, Alhamdulillah. And they probably, like you said, they'll deal with Corona. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it does make us reflect. From, I mean, this is what, this is... Go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was saying, I think this is an important point to understand that in places like Palestine, uh, Gaza, um, uh, in Syria, in many other places where the Muslimin are facing this war, even Yemen, in, in many of these places, we have to understand that this, they're doing a service to the whole Ummah. You know, they've built up this resilience. And this is why it's very important for us to support these people. I always say to brothers and sisters, look, there's a lot of charities working, but they're supporting Syrian refugees who have fled. Yeah, they need help. And not everybody has the ability to stay inside Syria. But if everybody was to leave Syria, then there would be an ethnic cleansing this country would no longer be for Ahlul Sunnah. And that's the reality. That's something that, you know, people might say that sectarian or whatever it is. No, we have to say it how it is. That if the people here were not to stay, then this area would no longer be for Ahlul Sunnah. So this is it's a very important point to understand. These people are doing a wajib. They're staying here, mm -hmm. um, not under nice conditions, not under good conditions. They're staying here and doing a service for everybody, like the people in Palestine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like you said, uh, Assad really wants that land and he's, he's going to do what he needs to do. Uh, and he tried, obviously, a couple of months ago uh, to take over Idlib and take over that, that, that probably the long, last stronghold of, uh, you know, the, the, the fight back. But um, if, that, if that is taken, then it's kind of done, done deal for Syria and uh, the people would need to move out. But alhamdulillah, like you said, uh, they are the, the ones that are you know, really struggling for the for the rest of the ummah and and same applies to uh, to palestine um and, and and kashmir and other lands as well but um the, the 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 reflection we can make as those living in the west is that you know now that we've gone through some sort of you can't even like like much said you can't really call it a trial you can call it an inconvenience and i'm having to be uh, self isolating within our homes uh, not being able to see family and not being able to go to the mosque inshallah i think one thing benefit that may come from it is that we can get a bit of a glimpse of how the most of the ummah that are suffering in the, in the Muslim lands have had it so much worse. And going through an experience, you can at least have that practical feeling of, of not being able to speak to family, 
and inshallah it should hopefully open our hearts and minds to the, the Muslims even further and, and not become individualistic and just think about ourselves and be a bit more communal, know that we're part of one ummah. And I think that, that inshallah, that's a, a silver lining from some of this, that uh, we wake up and recognize that, you know, the, the Muslims have gone far, through far worse. Um, and, it, and, the, and the difference is that with COVID, it's a natural phenomenon, right? Uh, something that's happened and, and, you know, we accept it. But um, with the situation in Syria and in Gaza and Palestine, it's not natural, it's political, right? It's, uh, the, the, it's, it's, it's the actions of human beings that has caused the situation and uh, in order to solve that we need to there needs to be a political solution and really it just shows the, the enmity of those who have kind of conspired against the ummah and we need to we need to wake up and, and recognize this i think i think one of the takeaways that i'll take from covid um it always you know i would say that a test like this could either make you or it could break you yeah and i believe for people that believe in atheism, capitalism, a lot of these isms, they're struggling because their life is based on dunya. Yeah. But for the believer, and I, and I read one of the sheikhs saying this, that for us, even if we're locked in our homes, even if we're locked in a prison, Islam continues. Islam continues. So for us, it becomes a time of more reflection, pondering on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pondering on the power and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he can bring the whole world to a standstill, how we had made certain priorities, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has changed that. And it reminds me, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. That maybe, yeah. you know, uh, there will be something that is, you know, that you hate, but it will be good for you. Wa asa an tuhibbuhu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. Sharrun lakum. And maybe that you will love something, mm. but you know, it'll be bad for you. So you can say that maybe people love you know, to be out um, and have this freedom in the dunya, but that takes them away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And maybe being on lockdown reminds them that, you know what? We are this small creation uh, that's been put here for a certain reason. Um, and I think that's very important. Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah also says that a calamity that brings a person closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a blessing is a greater is a blessing is greater than a blessing that takes someone away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay. so okay. this is is a really important concept I think for the Muslim Ummah even we were worried we were worried that you know what this year donations are going to be less people are not making money they're locked in their homes you know etc but subhanAllah we've seen subhanAllah in the first three days of Ramadan Hamza, the Muslim community has become more generous why? Because they've had this realization that, you know what, tomorrow I might die. They've had this realization that, you know what, tomorrow, you know, look, everything that I was doing, maybe that wasn't, you know, Allah SWT has redirected my priorities in life. So I think this is a blessing uh, of being a Muslim, especially in this time. Yeah, yeah no, it just reminds me of that hadith in which Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that, you know, the amazing, amazing or wondrous is the believer um, that when he has good, he's grateful to Allah. He says, Alhamdulillah. But when a calamity strikes him, or whether there's, you know, a, a, a bad or an evil, he's still grateful to Allah. So, you know, a Muslim is not, we don't sway too far to the right and left. Uh, we're happy when Allah gives up, but we know it's a blessing from Allah. And we know that Allah can take it away from us. So when a calamity strikes and when uh, we do lose uh, a bit of dunya, we're still grateful because it's still from Allah. And I think that mentality is what makes a believer. And it really distinguishes us from the disbelievers who are, you know, going through depression and you know, even before COVID, depression is a massive thing in the West, right? And I'm not belittling it, you know, it, it does happen. But only when you have that purpose in life and you know why you're here, you see that you're still content. So the Syrians and the Palestinians and all the Muslims that are suffering for years, um, yes, they're suffering, but they, they still have that contentness and uh, tawakkal in Allah because that's Islam. That's, that's how we're, you know, that's what we're, that's what we believe in. And that's the difference. And I think that COVID has also allowed us as Muslims living in the West to experience a little bit of that as well. The thing is as well, for Muslims, if you've got the right mentality, it's a win-win situation. You know, in the times of good, you, you know, you, you make shukr. You thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the times, you know, when things are difficult, you know, you have sabr. You know, so at the end of the day, you know, the reality is, is like, you know, this is a journey. We're on a journey. You know, at the end of the day, the terrain Sometimes it might be a good terrain. Sometimes it might be a bad terrain. But the most important thing 
is the destination. We should always keep our destination in mind because the reality is, is the Akhirah is forever. Okay, and we can suffer for a certain amount, and it's easy saying that you know, uh, without being in as war zone, for example. But, but the, the reality is, is that no matter what you can suffer, Allah says He doesn't burden a soul with more with, with something which you know more than it can take. So you have to have the mentality. But you know, if you don't have the mentality, then like you're saying, you can for people fall into depression because this dunya has become everything, and now that these things have been taken away from them, you know, I, I read in the papers, people, there was one guy. Uh, he committed suicide. Uh, he wasn't a Muslim, but he committed suicide because you know he couldn't uh, he couldn't take the self isolation. You know why? Because the dunya for them is everything, and if you take those small things away from them that mean everything to them, their life has no purpose. It has no meaning. It has no reason. You know. So for a lot of them, the best way is to is to just just cut it short. But I just want to just want to pick up on some of the, what the talk said, and I, I never really saw it this way. But you know, the reality is is that. In the, the Muslims that are living in the Muslim lands, uh, in all reality, that's where the Muslims belong, right? Obviously, uh, we're in the West, and you know that can still be linked to colonialism and and, and whatnot. Um, and especially places like Syria or Palestine, as an example, as well. That you know the people there at any time they could just put their hands up. Just say Palestine, for example. You know, for for decades. The, the Zionists have been offering compensation to the, the Palestinians there, the, Mus the Muslims of Palestine to say, look, you know, forget about your houses. It's gone now. Your villages are gone. You know, just take this compens compensation and let's just finish the matter there. But they haven't. You understand? They've, they've said no. You know, the people of uh, in Al-Aqsa, you know, the, the, the people have you know, the sisters, even the sisters have become a barrier for the plans of the Zionists and you know, it really goes to show that subhanallah that there's some something great about these people because at any stage like any other human you could think you know what I, I want ease in life you know I want I want to just just chill just just you know catch up on Netflix and just you know go to the park with my kids you know why am I in the front zone why am I you know on the front line and I think that's something where we don't give enough credit to the Muslims that are in this situation because you know like, like brother talk said if the Muslims were to emigrate who's going to live in that land now you know the the plans of the of the West are going to be, you know, successful in what they're trying to do. They're trying to carve. They're trying to change the demographic of that land, change. You know, carve it up. In, you know, so whose plan is it? So who's what's who's an obstacle? It's the people that are an obstacle. And Alhamdulillah, we got to give credit to that. But I think one thing that's important because his brother Tox mentioned about Muslims are helping. But my I personally think that obviously, you know. Uh, Muslims are in a situation where we give sadaqah to the Muslims wherever they are, wherever, wherever they're in difficulty, because this is this is not a charity. Okay, this is a worship for from our part. It's a worship. It's not like you know the the Western concept of charity where you know you got a couple of pence in your pocket and you know you got nothing to do with it, so you're gonna pass it on. It's, this is an, this is a worship. But I think maybe what do you think the fact that for us Muslims that are just say in lockdown. Um, the reality is, is we've got restrictions on our life now. Okay, now no matter how much money, no matter how much how much uh, how much money or how many uh, bags of toilet roll we've got at home, right? The situation isn't going to change for the better with those things. It's gonna have you know the the the, the solution for it is going to be something else. So maybe for Muslims as well that you know we can appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sending my sadaqah to Kashmir or to to Syria or wherever. But the reality is, is that for me to just think, I've you know ticked off this box now. That's it. I've done my bit for for the Muslims for Islam in that land. You know, maybe now people will start thinking that actually, you know what, these things, you know, they give short term uh, satisfaction or short term uh, a short term relief. cure, a relief. But the reality is, is that you know, if I'm feeding someone today, tomorrow he's going to be hungry again. You know, so maybe well, this, this is. The, this is this is a really important point, yeah? Um, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say, look, I've worked in aid and charity for over 10 years now, alhamdulillah. Um, and I will be the first person to say that aid, giving sadaqah, is not a solution. Subhanallah. Um, this is very, very important. It's like putting a bandage on an open wound. And unfortunately, the ummah right now has many, many wounds. So now if I'm just getting bandages and putting them all over, what's going to happen? I'm going to die. I'm eventually, I'm going to bleed out and I'm going to die. So we as Muslims, we need to start thinking long term. And I've spoken about this many times before. We need to start building institutions. Um, and that, those building of institutions will lead to us building a greater institution. Um, because you have, look, 
you have many people that speak about Khilafah and building a, a place that we can call you know, a place for Muslims. Mm. But this is not going to come without stages and steps. You understand? The Khilafah didn't fall in the Ottoman mm. Empire, didn't fall in one day. It fell, it, it fell in stages. So likewise now, if we believe that tomorrow the Mahdi is just going to come and we're going to have, you know, straight away, we're just going to have, you know, some Khilaf, it's not, it's not going to drop out the sky. No. It mm. needs work. And this is why I take my hat off to people like yourself um, doing a podcast. You're building an institution. We want to put our own narrative out there in the media. So the media is part of it. Financial institutions. We as Muslims, when it comes here, yeah, Muslims have a lot of wealth. But when it comes to actually owning financial institutions, banks, um, these kind of things, we don't have it. Investing in our own Muslim countries. Why do we see so many of these people that are raping Muslim lands, like many of the ex-Pakistani leaders, I'll speak about Pakistan because I'm Pakistani, um, building massive skyscrapers in, in England, building yeah. buildings, you know, in England. Where's the investment in Pakistan? Um, um, so many other things, you know, charity institutions need to be built in the right manner where uh, they're building sustainable projects, not just giving out food packs, not just giving out tents. Um, for example, um, human rights organizations. We've got organizations like Cage, for example, who is a, a, a warrior standing alone. You know, Cage is, uh, faces the constant barrage of attacks from, you know, uh, Zionist lobbies. But mashallah, they're doing a service for the Ummah. You've got people like Interpal. Interpal is also always facing bank closures, etc., etc. And this is the, the way that we need to think. We need to think about becoming active. Uh, even our masajid, our masajid can't remain as just places of worship. We close the door after every salah. No, they need to become community centers. They need to become hubs. They need to become institutions like they were at the time of the Prophet So we as a Muslim community, we need to build grassroots, you know, uh, uh, organizations and institutions. Uh, if I was to ask you, how many renowned uh, universities do we have in the Muslim world? You know, if we're going to come back to, you know, uh, uh, have this Hadara or this empire, or we're going to bring glory back to Islam, you know, you could name them on, on your hands and then you'd still have, you know, uh, qualms. If you would say, for example, Medina, Al-Azhar, uh, uh, Damascus, etc. How many, where are the Muslim universities? Whereas if you look at the West, you've got MIT, you've got Imperial, you've got uh, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and the list goes on and on and on. So when it comes to institutions, we as an ummah, we're very, very far behind. And this is what my message will be to everybody when it comes to media, when it comes to all the different things that make an, a community successful, we need to work in that. I mean, even in the charity sector, for example, when Muslims started opening uh, uh, fundraising platforms, the Muslim community was like, no, we're not going to support these. They're charging fees and, you know, we can go and get it free for someone else. Okay, why can that company give it to you for free? Because, you know, they're raping resources from Muslim lands for hundreds of years. So now, they, you know, they, 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 they control many of the banks. Whereas now, today, okay, you're going to lose today. You're going to have to spend, you're going to have to give a bit of your, impart with a bit of your wealth today to help this Muslim organization build a platform or build a payment portal. But in the future, inshallah, that's going to benefit the Muslimin. And this is the way that, you know, we really need to think. Subhanallah. I think, you know, what, what you said there, uh, just to touch upon that, i.e. The, the building of the of the society and the state, and we can see, subhanallah, from the seerah, that when uh, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he emigrated to Medina, you know, the the society had already been built prior to that. So when he went there, you know, he went there not as like, uh, you know, the Orientalists tried to try to make out like a refugee or something. He went there, he was already the, 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 the leader of Medina. And when he went there, he was welcomed as such. And what's important is that many people, uh, for example, when they think of Sharia or they think about uh, Islam, they think about rules and they think about punishments and, and, and stuff like this. But the reality is, if you look in Medina at that time when the, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived there, uh, very few, if any, ahkam, i.e. rules and laws um, to do with the state had been revealed. But the, the society was built on the aqidah. You know, the people, well, and we see from the second pledge of Aqaba that, you know, when the Ansar were sounded out, 
you know, they said that we're willing to sacrifice everything we have, our families, our children, you know, everything for, for this mission of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what we can see is that what's really important is that as, as an ummah, uh, the, the Islam is going to return in the same way the Ansar, the same way they, for example, made that pledge. And as Muslims, this is what we need to do. And the only issue is that, you know, when you speak about universities and stuff, the reality is, is that it's not just about the, the education. Why I say that is because a lot of these people that you meet who are graduates from Medina, who are graduates from these places, the reality is they've been taught Islam in a very academic way. It's very disconnected from the reality. Um, so we can, have these, we can have these universities, but if the right understanding isn't being taught, I think we'll have graduates, but we won't have change. That, that's my opinion. Uh, yeah, I agree. What I was going to say, just to add to the points you guys are making, I think it is definitely very important that uh, we view it from a grassroots kind of on the ground level. And talk, sorry, you're, you're in the Muslim land, so you can definitely relate to this more than us, to be honest. But um, the, the reason that's important is that, and this is not me kind of throwing shade on anyone, really. Everyone's doing their bit, and that's fine. But, you know, one thing that we definitely have to move away from as Muslims is this attitude of like sloganizing like just shouting khilafa and just shouting the solution just to make the solution happen overnight right mm -hmm. we have to take the the right steps like you said uh, and and, and it is it is that transitionary step uh, that will achieve the the end goal and like you said uh, maj um we do something else talks you may may or may not be aware but we have another podcast called talking sira and the whole point of talking sira is to really build uh, those building blocks uh, so that people understand the seerah, not just from an academic level, but from a practical way. So relating those events in the life of the Prophet wasallam to how we can now understand it and apply it in today's reality uh, to bring about Islam the way the Messenger brought about Islam. So that, that is essential. And I'll you know, encourage any Muslim just to, this Ramadan, pick up the book of Sirah. It's very, you know, very simple. There's lots of versions out there. Even if it's a simple version, just pick it up because it really lets you, gives you, an understanding of why the Messenger ﷺ was sent. And, and the reason that's important is that we, we have been taught in Islam, especially in the West, was very secularized. Um, when, we went, when we went to Arabic school, uh, we, we taught Quran, but we weren't really taught how do we apply Islam in our lives. Yeah, we want to be good people and we want to have good manners, and that's not a problem at all. Our parents taught us that. But when it comes to understanding what is that objective of Islam, why was the Messenger actually sent to us, I think we need to refer to that Sira. And you know, I'd encourage people to listen to the Sira if they can. If they can't read a book, uh, read, read Sealed Nectar, read some of the simple books uh, to gain that understanding. And in terms of your, uh, just to touch on something else you mentioned about uh, the solution, the, the reality is that every one of us has a duty, right? And that duty, we need to understand what we need to kind of satisfy. So um, me as a husband, I have a duty to my wife. Right? And that's my duty. You know, brother talks, imagine no other person can fulfill that duty for my wife. It's me, right? And I don't have any children yet, but if I have children, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. I have to fulfill that inshallah. duty to my children, yeah? Um, so even if I was absent, right, my wife can not now go on to another man or, you know, ask someone else to fulfill that duty. That's my duty. And I'll be accountable for that, right? And it reminds me of the hadith, in, and I'm going to paraphrase, so cor uh, correct me if I say it wrong, but, you know, the hadith in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, uh, you know, all of you are shepherds, right? And the imam is a shepherd for the people, right? And, the, uh, and his subjects. Uh, the husband is a shepherd for his wife and his family. Uh, the, the, the woman is a shepherd for her household. These duties and responsibilities only apply to those people. I cannot now go and take the duty of the imam because I'm not the imam. I can't take the duty of my wife because I'm not the woman, right? Um, and, and we need to understand what our place is and how we uh, you know, go about uh, the solutions in Islam. And like you said, understand what that long-term vision is, a long-term solution, how, how we get there. Yeah, Brother Tox, you were gonna say something earlier. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. But <laughs> the brother made a. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. It's cool. Now, uh, brother Jai made a, a very important uh, point uh, in terms of people uh, knowing what their role is. But I think, I think for a lot of people, and I, I'd relate it back to my own story. There was a time that um, I didn't know what my 
their role was or what I was supposed to do. Do you understand? And I think many people go through this in their life. Mm. And the reality is, is that there's no, we don't have, you know, I remember when we were in school, you have someone like a career advisor. You sit with them and they say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up and blah, blah, blah. When it comes to uh, Islam and the Muslim Ummah, there's no one that's going to come to you and say, oh, brother, what would you like to do to serve the Ummah? Because we don't have that institution, do you understand? So what we need is we need a different kind of attitude. Uh, we need a motivated Muslim that sees a problem and he doesn't wait for anybody else to you know, tell him, listen, bro, you need to go do ABC. We need grassroots institutions to be built. So that means me, it, when I'm saying institutions, it doesn't mean, oh, we have to build these wonderful buildings and do ABC. No, it doesn't mean that. It means me in my community. Mm. Okay, if I see that there's an issue in my community, there's youngsters selling drugs now. There's, you know, uh, kids getting involved in the wrong things. Okay, we as a community now, some of the elders, we get together and we say, okay, guys, look, let's do something for these youth so we can push them away from that. 100%. Because like Brother Majid said, is the streets, the streets will, you know, greet them with open arms. So if we're going to close our masjids, mm. um, close the doors of the masjids, then, then the streets are gonna, is going to open its doors. So again, Definitely. it's about being proactive wherever you are. And you finding that role because nobody's going to give you that role. Nobody said to me 10 years ago, if someone told me when I was in you, listen, you're going to be an aid worker and work in all these different countries mm -hmm. and you're going to live in Syria and blah, blah, blah. I would have been like, what are you talking about? You're bonkers. But <laughs> that, was a, that was an awakening. And that was something where I saw that, you know what, inshallah, I can be of use and help the ummah in this field. And I think everybody needs to do that. Either begin on that journey of searching for what their role is and Allah. maybe you'll never find it. But the beauty of Islam is, is that you begin. You say, Ya Allah, I want to help this ummah. I want to raise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word to the highest and I want to continue working. And inshallah ta'ala, you will find your place. But if we're going to sit there and we're going to wait and we're going to say, you know what, someone's going to come and give me a golden ticket and then I'm just going to go do it. No, it's, it's not going to work like that. The ummah, mm. and going back to the seerah, was built on sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The ummah was oh, built on yeah. people saying, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice what I have for the sake of this mission. And this is why we see the, the graves of the Sahaba. They're not all in Medina. They're not right. all in Mecca. Do you think that they didn't know the rewards of, you know, praying in Masjid and Nabawi? They could have said, okay, we're just going to stay here. We're going to chill here forever. But they went out. They were proactive. And they spread the message, you know. Uh, the, 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 the conversation between Muad ibn Jabal. And the Prophet is, 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 is really, really beautiful when Mu'ad is walking with the Prophet and he's leaving Medina. And he knows that this is the last time he's ever going to see the Prophet But the Prophet is sending him to Yemen. And the advice that the Prophet gives him is profound. Um, but imagine, imagine, look, that's a sacrifice. Imagine you're with the Prophet But he left the Prophet to go to a foreign land, to go to a distant land. To sacrifice, to do what? To teach the people, to build an institution, to to you know, to, you know, to do the work of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So I think mm. I think we've got to understand that that we've got to have a calling, and if we really want these things, we can't just be people of empty words and say, yeah, 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 we want, you know, we've got to put the work in. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And just to like relate to uh, when I first saw you, because you were involved in the flotilla issue, right, uh, with uh, Turkey and uh, Palestine. And I remember yeah, seeing right. the, the Mavi Mamra. Yeah, I saw you on the news. I was like, wait, I, rem I know that brother. I, was, I swear I know him. Um, and I thought, subhanAllah, like, you're out there. On, on, you know, credit where credit is due. Like, uh, you, you, yeah, we were all confused and we were trying to find our way in uni. But when you knew that you can help somewhere and, and your role, um, definitely you, you just took the step. You know, you, you had to leave your parents and family. Uh, I don't know where they are. They're in Nottingham, I'm not sure. But um, you have to leave your parents and family or London at London possibly, um, and just make the step. And it's really difficult as, you know, I'll say it myself, you know, I, I, I can't even imagine if I could do, make such a step. But um, credit where credit is due, you just did it. And you've see, I've seen you do lots of things in Palestine and Syria now, obviously, uh, with live updates and stuff like that. So um, I, think, I think you're right. We need to really understand what our role is and, and refer back to the Sira and the Sunnah. Uh, and know that, you know, the Sahaba, like you said, uh, when you go to Istanbul, for example, you see uh, the grave and, uh, of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And that's not because uh, he was having a holiday in Istanbul, like we are. We are. 
you know, he was, uh, he was making jihad there. He was, uh, he was trying to, uh, you know, fight the war of Constantinople and, 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 and conquer Constantinople as the prophet had kind of uh, prophesied. So these, these are the, the stories that we need to relate back to and understand that the greatest of generations were, were doing this. So, yeah, no, totally agree with, with what you're saying. I think a lot of it is like what you guys are saying about, I think, motivation. The motivation is key. Um, because I would say that, you know, like even before finding your role, the reality is, is that I think uh, for many of many Muslims that I see, um, I think a lot of people don't really understand what it means to be a Muslim. You know, because a, a lot of us are living our lives like everybody else. But a Muslim stands for some. A Muslim, he means something. He has a purpose. He has a mission. That's a, that is a Muslim. So I think, you know, that needs to be, you know, at a very fundamental level when we contact people, whether it's the youth or whether it's the community leaders. When you contact them, basically, you need to um, instill in them that motivation. That Because you can tell people, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. But, you know, if it's not from within themselves... They, if they did, if they did do it, it'd be half-hearted. So you need that motivation that people think, you know what, I'm willing because sacrifice is only going to come when a person is willing to make that sacrifice. You know, and I think that's something which is so you know, really key. You know, one one of the sheikhs that I really like, uh, Sheikh Zahir Mahmoud, uh, may Allah bless him. Um, he always says something which has always stuck with me, um, and he says, "Inspire to aspire before you expire." <laughs> and you know subhanallah this is a really really profound statement that we should inspire to aspire people you know to activate them you know to get them involved in what's Sorry. taking place in the ummah before we die um, because ultimately we're going to die and if we can do that it's like it's like you know the olympic torch the olympic torch the fire keeps burning you know one person passes it to the next person to the next person and that's what it is we need to keep that light of islam burning we need to make sure that we're passing it on to as many people as possible, whether that's within our own families, whether that's within our locality, as in our community, whether that's in our city or town, or whether that's, you know, on social media, using platforms like this to try and, you know, uh, make that difference, inshallah ta'ala. So, bro, you know, in, in, in Syria then, because um, obviously you've been there for a while now in Idlib, right? Um, you know, the, the trials and tribulations that the Muslims are, are, are experiencing there. Would you, because obviously we, we see it through media or, you know, through Twitter and stuff like videos, but obviously you're on the ground there. So would you say that, uh, you know, from, from the normal people, from the masses, that these trials and tribulations, are they making, are they making us stronger as an ummah? Um, you know, what the people are experiencing on the ground? So what, what is it? Is it bringing them closer to the deen? Is it, you know, is it, is it um, preparing them for what's to come? You know, uh, subhanAllah, there's many uh, hadith when it comes to Bilal al-Sham. Um, and one of the words that the Mashaykh used, they say, tasfiyah, it's a filtration process. Mm. So that Bilal al-Sham, the Prophet ﷺ said that, Tuba al sham um, that, you know, glad tidings to Sham. And, uh, you know, the wings of angels rest over Sham. And there's many hadith that speak about the, 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 the blessings of Sham. And even, for example, the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, is a uh, sham, fala the Prophet said that if the people of Sham are corrupted, then there is no goodness in all of you, as in the whole Ummah. Yeah. So some of these statements are very profound, powerful statements, and you don't really understand them until you live in these places like Palestine. Like, uh, I mean, Palestine is part of Sham, okay? Yeah. Uh, Syria is part of Sham, okay? So when you live in these places and you see, subhanAllah, you see uh, the resilience and you see what people are standing for. They say, we are here because we are Muslim and we believe in la ilaha illallah and this is why we're being killed. That is a certain power that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give people. Mm -hmm. um, imagine now, uh, while all this corona stuff is going on, there's been an ongoing struggle um, here on the ground where... People have wanted to close the masajid, but the people have basically just revolted. They said, no, we're going to keep all the masjids open. Now, I know people have their views about this, mm. okay? But the people here are saying, look, if we can't close the marketplaces and we can't, when we go to get our aid in distributions, when the aid is distributed, we have to all gather. For our dunya, if we're going to gather, why are we not going to gather for our akhirah? So they said, we're not going to accept. We're not going to accept to close the masajid. 
They said, if it's going to be a complete ban and we're going to do social distancing like the West, okay, we'll accept it. But for everything else to be open and for the masjids to be closed, we're not going to accept it. So there's this will, there's this rejuvenation of, of Islam within the people. And I think this is one thing that's very important, that if Islam is left in a place to uh, grow, it will flourish by itself. It will flourish by itself. And unfortunately, the reality is, is that many people or many governments or many world powers, they see that as something scary. They see that as a threat. Because the reality is, is that Islam is the only religion or ideology that does not fit with globalization. Globalization is based on capitalism, is based on the sexualization of, of, of women. It's built on greed. Um, and this is all of the things that Islam is against. Islam is not secular. We don't split our religion and, and, and the government. No, they are one and, and the same. So we don't put the Bible you know, on the shelf uh, on the weekdays and then on Sunday, you know, we pick up the Bible. We don't do that with the Quran. The Quran should be something that we're living every single day. And that's a very difficult concept for many people in the world to accept. And, and, and that's why I feel that in places like this, they are, you could say, very, very special places. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them this status for a reason. Even Yemen, if you look at Yemen now, if you look at Palestine, if you look at uh, Sham here, yeah, the people are going through struggles, but 100% I believe that this is making the people stronger. We see it every day. We see it every day. I've seen miracles. I've seen people who've had their whole, I've seen mothers who've seen all of their sons killed and maybe they have one son left and they'll be like, listen, he's going to go to the front lines. You know, he has to go and we're going to support him. And inshallah, if he gets shaheed as well, then alhamdulillah, I'm going to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't see that in other places except for places like Palestine and Sham. You don't see that in other places, you know. So where does this come from? This comes from a true sense of iman and tawakkal which doesn't exist. You know, unfortunately, you know, the reality is a lot of our parents, they say, oh, Puttar, you know, don't go, just give some money, you know, they will say, you know, to talk about the kids and, the, and all this kind of stuff. You know, that's the reality. But the, the difference is that there is mothers in the Ummah that are like Safiya. Do you understand? There are mothers still in the Ummah today that are like Sumayya. And this is what we need to come back to. I know it might sound harsh and it might sound bad, but the reality is, bro, you know, the Prophet ﷺ prophesied this when he said that a time will come and the nations, you know, the, uh, will, you know, the Muslims will be massacred um, like nations sitting around the table or like, uh, uh, like people are gathered around the table and, and, and taking piece by piece by piece. And the Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, is that because we'll be in small in number? And he said, no, you'll be great in number. And he said, so why is this? He said, because you will have a wahan in your hearts. And he said, what is this wahan? He said, a love of the dunya and a hate, and, 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 and a hate of death. And unfortunately, this is what many of us have. This is what, you know, this is what I had. And may Allah accept me, you know. And may Allah, you know, uh, you know protect me from I mean. the, the love of dunya ever coming into any of our hearts, you know. Because it's a dangerous, dangerous thing, bro. But bro, on, on, uh, that, on that point on the hadith, you know, like, because what I was thinking is, you know, when people speak about uh, the, the state of the Muslims and when they think about, you know, issues of uh, revival or khilaf or stuff like this. And, and the thing is, what we can see is that uh, the enemies of Islam are deliberately destroying the Muslim lands, destroying the, the, the militaries and whatever capabilities and infrastructure, etc. Right. To st send them back to the Stone Ages. But what I was thinking is, I was thinking, you know, in reality, and this is why I should have questioned, because whatever I've, whenever I've seen footage, a mother's lost their child. She's saying Allahu Akbar, right? Uh, and 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 a, a, a guy is being pulled out a rubble, yeah, a rubble, uh, and he's saying Allahu Akbar. And you're thinking, Subhanallah, this is amazing. And and then I was thinking that, you know, as an ummah in these places, you know, you spoke about the the wahan, the love for this life and the hate for death. The thing is, is you know, that side of the world, whether it's Iraq or Syria, these places, the people don't have anything, right? So what we've got is now think about population. Think about people on mass, i.e. populations. Now think about the West. The West people are materialistic. For them, their life is more sacred than anything, right? Mm -hmm. Now imagine when there's going to be a conflict, which will happen in the future. Subhanallah. In one way, it's like, the way I see it is like you know the the ummah in that land. 
the, as an ummah, they're being prepared as an ummah, not as a, as a, 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 a militia or a faction, as an ummah that, mm-hmm. you know, when the, the, when things are going to, you know, get crazy and, and, and when it's time to sacrifice, those people are being used to making sacrifices. You know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. and here, a, co- a couple of things will rain down. Not, I'm not trying to promote any, anything, but, you know, a few issues and people will, they'll be screaming and they'll be saying to their governments, listen, you know, what are you doing? Why are you putting our lives in danger? So I think, subhanAllah, there's a process that's going on. And, and these people, like you said, bro, there's something special within them. And this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, yeah. I just, just to add, um, you know, I once had this conversation with a brother and uh, I'm not going to name any names, right? But um, the, the, basically the narrative was that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, punishing the people of Syria and Palestine, yeah? SubhanAllah, I was like, with this trial, right? And I was like, SubhanAllah, are you, are you mad? Like, how can you say, uh, say this? Um, so does that mean Allah is pleased with us here doing nothing, chilling, uh, and, and living a comfortable life? Yeah, and unfortunately, he, uh, unfortunately, this mentality exists. I've dealt with this a lot. <coughs> um, this is an ignorant, mm. ignorant, jahil mentality. And unfortunately, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, you have a certain sect, you know, I, I'll say, I'm not shy to say, you know, you've got Madkhalis and Saudi Salafis that, you know, believe in this kind of, this kind of thing. Um, not all of them, not all of them, but this is something that they, uh, many of them say and speak about, which is, which doesn't have a nas, this is not something that is, you know, um, uh, 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 true. Does this mean, you know, I mean, any time that anyone, you know, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was, you know, there was a famine, you know. Um, they went through hardships. Does this mean that you know Allah was punishing them? No, it doesn't. It means that Allah was preparing them. Allah was preparing them. And you know exactly what Prophet Majid said. You know we have to look at things. Allah SWT said in the Quran that He will test a group of people, uh, a group of men by another group of men. And yeah. it's a test for us. It's easy for us to say, oh yeah, Allah is punishing them, blah blah blah, whatever, whatever. But this is this is a nonsensical argument, which comes unfortunately from a love for. Uh, certain leaders or certain people and those people I believe um, when those leaders are no longer in power they will feel what we were talking about with other people maybe they will feel like committing suicide maybe they'll feel like you know the world has fallen uh, apart around them because their aqidah is what is linked to a person you know it's not linked to firm concrete beliefs it's linked to it's linked to people and 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 countries and and governments etc etc so that's that's my yeah. opinion on that issue. I've heard oh, yeah. it a lot. Totally, totally agree. And uh, when I, it, was, it was difficult to kind of keep calm when someone said this, but um, the thing is, it, it goes against the Quran. I mean, it goes against the words of Allah. So, you know, put away, uh, even, even, we don't need to use any shakes, uh, quotes, or anything like that. Just go to the words of Allah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, we will test your people. Uh, you know, you, will you be left to say that we believe and not be tested? And Allah will, yeah. you know, distinguish th- from the ones who are truthful. And the one from the ones who are not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is saying that there's going to be tests, right? There's going to be trials, and this is how Allah will will uh, distinguish. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this, right, how can we come up with the argument that this is uh, the opposite, and this is punishment Allah is not happy? First of all, we don't know uh, any event that happens, we don't know, even this COVID crisis, we don't know the hikmah behind this. You know, Allah knows best, but at the end of the day, it's a trial and a tribulation, uh, nothing like what's happening in Syria, um, and those there are you know those trials that the people are going through there and in Palestine are far worse. And as you guys are saying, it's purely uh, about really preparing the people, uh, and they, they are the barriers of it. You know, they they are uh, standing on the, the forefront of Islam on behalf of the Ummah. So to 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 kind of even put them at a lower level is is very dangerous. Uh, yeah, it's the, the Prophet ﷺ said, "A dunya sijin al mu'min wa jannatul kafir." Prophet ﷺ said that the this uh, life is the prison of a for a believer, yeah. and it is the paradise for a disbeliever. So, you know, people in Syria, yeah, this literally right now we're kind of besieged. We're in a prison, okay. But Alhamdulillah, Inshallah Taala, this is this is what it's supposed to be like. You know, this is what it's supposed to be like because. This is what people are aspiring for. They're aspiring for the Akhara, inshallah ta'ala. You know, uh, many of the Salaf, you know, when they would see that they weren't going through trials and their life was going smoothly, they would become depressed. They would become sad because they would think that, you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love us. He's not testing us. You know, that was their mindset. So look at, look at where we are today. You know, 
we are so far from that. You know, today where someone can say, you know, uh, uh, you know, look, look, Allah is punishing them because you know they've been doing sins, etc., etc. You know, who are you to say that? I mean, I, I don't know if you saw a clip that went viral uh, a couple of days ago, Raheem Jung uh, on, on on TV, and yeah, yeah. he's he's speaking about people that are poor, and because they have a high level of iman and they don't have food every single day, they said we make a niya to awesome. fast, you know, every single day, just so inshallah we can get some reward. And the 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 brother was, you know, Masir. He was like. No, that's haram. That's not allowed. And, and he said, you know, Subhanallah, you know, look at certain people's, you know, understandings. And who are you? And who are you? You haven't, you haven't tasted an ounce of, of what these people have, you know, felt. And it's, and you're, 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 you're sitting there, you know, and, and, and saying ABC. So it's, it's unfortunately, it's one of those things where we will never know unless we step in someone else's shoes and uh, yeah. how we would react. And we always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us uh, and to give us tests that, inshallah, that we can pass and we can come through, you know. Um, and I think that's important. Going back to COVID, I think COVID is a test. Some people are going to come out of it with flying colors and they're going to come out of it with their iman stronger. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some people are going to come out of it and they're going to be in a bad situation. Um, and that's just the, 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 the fitrah. That's, the, that's just, you know... The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed this world, you know? Yeah, and that, and that is the speaking, side, isn't it? Speaking about tests and stuff, um, you know, the first time I, I came across you talks was on um, Facebook or Instagram. It must be Facebook. And it was a, uh, it was a short video you made about... Remember the probably making some noise. Probably making some noise and screaming <laughs> you, and shouting. You, 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 were, you were making noise. <laughs> and I thought, yo, this brother's hardcore, yeah? It was uh, that Shamima Begum issue. You know, and all the people here were like kicking up a fuss saying, oh, don't let her back in. And you were saying, yeah. listen... listen um, you know, uh, you house Muslims or so, some, I don't know, I can't remember how you phrased it, yeah, but you said, listen, without you realizing it, you know, you're second class citizen. So, on that note, we're talking about tests and trials, and, you know, I know it's been it's been about a month since I, I've not been able to go and see my parents and stuff like that, but what's the, what's the situation with your your citizenship uh, status and, and, you know, what's what's going off there, bro? Because, you know, uh, this, this was summer, which, to be honest with you, it, you know, it showed the highest level of hypocrisy, but but what was going? Because obviously, I, I didn't think I'd be speaking to you ever. But alhamdulillah, this has happened. So, what, what's the situation on that? Well, to be honest, right now I'm I'm stateless. Yeah, I'm stateless, which is to be honest, it's quite. Uh, what's the word? What, what's the word that they use? They say I'm. See, I'm forgetting English now. You know, um, it's it's empowering in a way. I tell you why. Yeah, people find that strange, and they're like, "You're anti-Britain." No, I'm not anti-Britain. Okay, but. At the end of the day, unfortunately, sometimes we put so much trust in a small, you know, red book. Um, when the reality is that this world is controlled by who? It's controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So if he wills for me to go somewhere else or be somewhere else, then, you know, then he will will for that to happen. Whether I have a citizenship or a passport, I don't. So for me, it's empowering. For me, it's like, alhamdulillah, you know what? It is what it is, isn't it? I, uh, you know, like... Malcolm X said, and Brother Hanif, who we were speaking about earlier, he's yeah. the one who actually gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X, and that had a profound impact on my life. Um, Malcolm X said, if you don't stand for something, then you'll fall for anything. Yeah. So inshallah, as, as long as you know, we have yaqeen and 100% certainty that what we are standing for is 100% the haqq and the truth, then who cares? Who cares? Then you know, I'm willing to lose everything, inshallah, my, my citizenship, uh, everything else. So the current status is is that it was I, I was going for an appeal, and the reason I wanted to go for an appeal is because I wanted to show the hypocrisy mm -hmm. of uh, of some of the the, the, the British laws um, mm -hmm. and how racist they are in the nature. And for me, it was more about raising awareness and giving that word to uh, many people in the West to show them that look, wait a minute, don't think that you know you're really equal because you're not. Um, you know, a white person could commit the same crime as you. But you'll be getting deported back to Pakistan yeah. and you'll be sitting in, in Mirpur or Jelam. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he'll be, he'll, be, he'll be chilling. He'll be facing a, a very different fate. So that was part mm -hmm. of it. Um, but, of course, with SIAC and secret courts in Britain, um, what I found was, and uh, Amnesty International and many of the big human rights uh, organizations, they say the same thing, is that they are uh, unfair. They're unjust courts. You know, how can you defend yourself in a court where you don't know 
what evidence is being presented yeah, exactly. against you. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's there's no jury, um, there's no charges being brought about. It's just loose terminologies. I mean, for example, what I'm being accused of is is, is so stupid. It's like I'm being accused of being affiliated to a group that is affiliated to Al Qaeda. So by default, one of the statements that I made is I said, okay, by default, you're saying that I'm not ISIS. By default, you're saying that I'm not Al Qaeda. By default, you're saying that I'm not part of a group that's affiliated to Al Qaeda. Then what, am I, what does this mean? You know, what does this mean? So this is like, it's guilty by, it's not even guilty by association. It's like guilty by association with a degree of separation. So it just yeah. shows how, how, you know, how, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, biased and, and racist is hypocritical these laws are so that's why i boycotted my appeal publicly um and alhamdulillah now um al jazeera did a full-length documentary on me inshallah inshallah should be uh, being released soon they came to syria and they filmed with us they filmed in the uk um it's uh, i don't know if you've seen the program uh, witness yeah. um basically their team came um they also filmed with my family in the uk as well inshallah so it's going to be a whole 40 minute to hour long documentary it's not finished mm. yet um, but they've been working on it for about a year. So inshallah, that should hopefully be beneficial. It's going to be called Stateless in Syria. So that should be uh, uh, beneficial in terms of highlighting uh, the, you know, the hypocrisy of these laws. And I think this is, again, this is an awakening. It's important for many Muslims living in the West to understand that, listen, we're not really at home. We're just guests, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, JK. No, all I, all I was going to say is... Uh, that, that was really, I mean, it was all over the news and a lot of the platforms, the Muslim platforms really did give you airtime, which is, which is great because it really highlighted this hypocrisy in that, you know, they, 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 they're happy to give any criminal uh, of their own uh, a home or state in the UK. But when it comes to Islam and when it comes to anything associated with Islam, and we, we know, you know, we, we know the reasons that they set up Daesh and ISIS and all of this uh, to kind of really put... Um, you know, show Islam to be in a bad light. So um, with your case and with the case of Shamima Begum, for example, it really showed that uh, this crime, you know, of, of being associated with Islam or anything like this is, is not forgiving. You know, we can't forgive it. I'm going to make them stateless. Um, but what, just to link it back to today and um, the reality we find ourselves today where um, this anti-immigrant and anti kind of Islam uh, that, Britain uh, really uh, highlighted when it came to Brexit. Um, the Brexit was really driven by this, right? And they voted for it, and it will happen soon, right? But um, with with COVID, uh, COVID nineteen, and the lockdown, the reliance they've had on immigrants in, in the NHS, for example, and the key workers really highlights that they need they need the immigrants, they need the Muslims. But the the message I really have is that we shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't be crying out for acceptance. Um, because the reality is, as, as, as the case with uh, Tok showed, we're not really accepted here. We're, they don't really want us. They don't really have uh, that, you know, they don't identify us as being British, which is cool because we're not British, we're Muslim. We have an Islamic identity and that is sufficient for us. And like you said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector. Allah is the owner of the world. And as long as we have association with Allah, we're happy. And, you better you know, be careful. You better be careful, mate. You might not pass the what's it called citizenship <laughs> test in the UK, and you might yeah. get deported, mate. Probably not. Who knows? Thing is, <laughs> most English, most English people wouldn't pass their citizenship test. That's true. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but thing is, you I know, from my we, point, we, we, yeah. Go sorry, on. I was just gonna say, talk start. You know what you said is uh, why well, you wanted to show to Muslims, i.e., through your messages, and 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 that's what that's what I gathered. And to me. The hypocrisy of the West, to be honest with you, are, we don't need the case of talks, for example, to, to know this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you in the Quran 1400 years ago that you know you cannot take these people as all yeah, right? But what it showed was that, and what I really liked about uh, the, the message that, uh, and I actually use this to be honest with you in my own da'wah, that look, you know, here's an example that you know, before used to be, you know, years ago, you know, the da'wah scene, you just think, yeah, you know what, if someone comes in, and you know, talks makes a good point, you know, without even thinking about it. You know, when people were being deported back to their lands, like Dawah carriers, whoever, you know, deep down, even though you don't want to say this, you think, you know, I got a red book. Yeah. So ain't nothing happening to me. Right. <laughs> but the thing is, is that but the, the reality is what that showed really, what that showed is, listen, you know, uh, 
this does not matter at all. The fact that if you do not accept their the, what values. they want, you, their values and everything like that, basically you're an alien, and you're an alien anyway. So I, to be honest, with you, I use that as an example uh, to many people because the the point that I try to make to people is look. Um, and some people may think it's harsh, but the way I see it really is when I see immigrants in the UK, not even Muslim. Uh, what I see is I see that these are signs of colonialism. I, these are signs that these people. Years ago, they went over, they were in these countries, uh, and when they needed uh, labor and stuff like this, these people came over, and, th- we, and we just so happy to stay behind, right? Um, but the, the mistake is that to think that you're part and parcel of this society, you're part and parcel of these people, you know, if you have that mentality, you're going to get a, a, a rude awakening uh, very soon because, you know, you know the, 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 the fighter who can see the punch coming and he clinches, right? He takes less of a blow. But the guy who's got his hands down and his chin out, he's getting knocked out. And that's, and right. that's why right. it's good to keep things in perspective. You use the blessings. Because at the end, they look where we're toxic, for example, and where we are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that blessing in the fact that, you know, there, there's no worry that some B-52 bomb is going to drop a bomb on you. That's the reality. So rather than just uh, taking this for granted, you need to... Think subhanAllah, Allah has put me in, Allah had a mission for me, Allah had a mission for talks, Allah had a mission for next man. How am I going to play out that mission? Mm. How, how, how am I going to use those blessings that Allah has given me for his deen and his mission? And I think that's the mentality that we should have. But we can't have that if we don't connect ourselves with the ummah. If we, if we see ourselves geographically as different, then you know what? Uh, we may send some money across, or we may not even do that. But we will be living in this illusion that that's their problem and we have our own issues. Hmm. Oh, the, re- the reality is, yeah, and uh, maybe people are going to listen to this. What I would say to them is that how many of them being second generation, third generation, maybe even fourth generation in the UK now, how many of them have, you know, land in their place of heritage? Hmm. I-, I give you an example. Majority of my granddad's land um, sold is sold like my for example my father sold all of his land he doesn't have any he doesn't have any land in pakistan now i'm saying to my dad listen go back and buy land there you know what i mean go go somewhere else you want to go to turkey you want to go somewhere else i advise people to invest in muslim countries you understand because the reality is there is this anti-muslim anti-immigrant sentiment and it's growing you know in the 90s you could say that this freedom of expression was on the rise in the UK and we had this golden era for Islam and Islamic institutes and etc. But now it's, it's, there's a recession and this anti, uh, you know, this right wing uh, racist uh, 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 rhetoric um, and this movement is growing, not just in the UK, yeah, growing, yeah. But, in, but in Europe as a whole with the banning of niqabs, with the banning of minarets, with the banning of uh, the adhan, all of these kind of things, it's clear. And like you said, if people don't wake up and smell the coffee, and they don't realize that this punch is coming and they don't start moving now and start mm-hmm. making, taking steps now. No one's saying sell up everything and leave and run away and people will say, oh, where should we go? Okay, it's not about where should you go. No, again, nowhere's going to be the perfect place for you to go. You're going to have to, the first people that go there, they are the ones who get the most reward because mm-hmm. they're the ones that, for example, now, the way I look at it is when our grandparents came and their first thing was just to get a small shop and build a masjid where they could all come together and pray. Mm. Inshallah, they're the ones to get the most reward for everybody that's playing in the message today because they're the ones who struggled. They were, they're the ones who got, you know, beaten up by the Paki bashers, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're the ones who got beaten up by the NF. So they went through that struggle. They had their shops smashed in. They went through all of that. For what? For us to pray peacefully in the message today. Um, so if no one's going to take that step, if no one's going to make that struggle to go to a different land and to open it up for... Uh, uh, the Muslimin and make it a place of, you know, a place of solace, a place of, you know, tranquility for the people, then who is? No one's going to, it's not going to happen just like that. So I think people need to start thinking about it, especially brothers in the Western, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us that, you know, we're educated, we have wealth, uh, you know, the sterling is strong. I mean, you could rent a property, if you own a property in the UK, you could put your property in rent and live anywhere you want, you know, Mm -hmm. in the world and have have extra you know to live on mm. so i think it's about again it comes down to comfort comes down to you know people being in their comfort zone and not wanting to come out of that um and we've got to go back to how the sahaba were going back to the sea right they came out of their comfort zone 
do you think it was easy for them to embrace Muhammad mm -hmm. وسلم, this man who is saying there's one God where all of their four, forefathers had been saying worship these idols it wasn't easy for them that's why in the beginning it was the youth it was Ali it was Abu Bakr it was you know it was a lot of these people that came to Islam it was the weak and the, the youth that came to Islam first then the strong started coming in the Hamzas the Omars etc etc and things started to change for Islam but before that Islam was in secret they had to you know they had to live in secret but mm -hmm. it was those first people who carried Islam mm -hmm. they were the ones that Islam is built on their backs you know the Bilal the Bilals that were being tortured in the street mm -hmm. you know why is his status so great a black slave is going to hold the cloak of the Prophet ﷺ and walk into paradise yeah. imagine so imagine I mean, even so, in the even in the it sera, was where, sacrifice. Um, yeah, no. What I was going to say, just to add to your point, even in the sera where um, you have narrations of like, um, what's his name? I forgot his name now. Um, totally forgot his name. Um, but um, Yah Khalid bin Walid and others that came into Islam after Bilal, right? But the status that Abu Bakr gave to Bilal was far greater, and, and they would have conversations as um, it wasn't it wasn't Khalid bin Walid, but it was the other. Oh, totally forgot the name. Uh, I think it's Abu Sufyan. I think it was Abu Dar al Ghafari. He had a he had an incident with Bilal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was the, the yeah where he where he still uh, he used a, a racist term or something like that. Yeah. But what I was referring to is where uh, yeah Abu Sufyan um, saw Bilal being treated more highly than himself, and he yeah. said to himself that look, you know, in our time before Islam, you know, Bilal was the lowest of the low. But now he's like the, the highest status. And, uh, and that's because they came to Islam first. And they went and, and when it was the most difficult time to accept Islam, uh, they accepted Islam ahead of all of these, these other ones that accepted Islam in, in comfort. You have to say Abu Sufyan accepted only after the conquest of, of Mecca. So uh, really highlighting that like you said, that it goes back to the hadith that you mentioned about al -Wahan, that living in the West, it's really easy, even though our past generations struggled and you know they they face the racism. Um, now we live in a, a life of comfort, and maybe we're getting a bit of a flavour of that racism now, and it, and it shows and highlights to us that we were never accepted, despite multiple generations living in this land, uh, they still treat us as, as like you said, Pakis and and second second class citizens. So we need to recognise that our belonging isn't here. Yes, we're here and we're. You know, because we're here because Allah allows us to be here, but, but, but in fact, our belonging is to, to the Islamic lands. And when we have the opportunity and when there is that security there, that we should have this vision of moving there with our families. And, and you know, you, I don't know how it was with you, your family when you decided to go to Syria. Uh, I don't know how your parents reacted, but, um, you know, just making sure that our parents and, and, and our generations know that we don't belong here and we will one day, inshallah, if it does happen, that we're, we're willing to go back to these lands thing is you know when you're saying willing to go back you know there's a there's an example that i think of i think it was um oh man one uh which one of these the sahabas one of the wealthiest sahabas uh, um, no 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 is um anyways you'll know which story is where basically when he uh when he was try attempting to migrate to medina the Sahib, Sahib Rumi. yeah i think yeah and, and basically he got caught and yeah. uh, he had to yeah, yeah. So pinpoint where his, where his wealth was for them to leave him. And I was yeah. thinking, subhanAllah, because, you know, with this ISIS and stuff like this, what these lot have done is they've put a template now. Basically, they've, like, this is like unwritten law now. The fact that if any, any area uh, they can call as ISIS, basically, they can just go, they can bomb it. If people want to go from this land to other lands, they can just take their... Uh, citizenship way and so, so they're setting a precedent right and I was thinking that you know just say tomorrow the, the, the Khilafah is announced do you think it's going to be easy for you to sell up and take all your wealth over there you know what subhanAllah at that stage you might need to just just, just you might need to leg it with, without anything but people yeah, that's need to right. be ready for that they can be like Puttar where are you going with all that money get over here bro <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah, man. So you know, like obviously, uh, uh, slowly bringing things uh, to an end. So, brother, talks. What, what's the briefly? What's the uh, current political situation in uh, in in Syria, Idlib, at the moment? Because, like you said, there's been uh, things have calmed down a little because of COVID. But um, but what what's going on there? 
Uh, the current political situation, um, yani briefly, is it's messy. Syria is messy. Everybody wants a piece of, of, of Syria. Um, Turkey and Russia are trying to act as guarantors, uh, but of course they have their own uh, interests as well. Mm. I do believe that Turkey has the, 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 this is my personal opinion, other people don't share it. I do believe that they do have the, 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 the you know, they do have a love for the Ummah and they do have, you know, the Muslims here in their hearts and they do want to help them. But as a power alone, you know, we can't expect them, you know, to take on Russia and to take on everybody by themselves. That's, that's you know, that's uh, unrealistic. It's, it's unfair for us to look at Turkey and say, oh, why isn't Turkey doing ABC? Okay, where's all the other Muslim countries? You know, mm-hmm. where is every other Muslim countries? Other Muslim countries, for example, the UAE, are funding Bashar al-Assad, mm-hmm. to understand. So it's, 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 it's very, very messy. It's a proxy war. Um, and right now, uh, on the M4 highway here in Syria, there's a stalemate. There's kind of Russian patrols going on um, with the Turks. But most people don't know this. Um, there's actually a sit-in protest taking place in Syria at the moment. Okay. Where many civilians are sitting on the M4 highway uh, and they're not allowing uh, the Russians or the Turkish to patrol. I was told earlier this morning that two protesters were actually shot and killed today. My so um, I'm not sure. Different reports. So, so we're not sure who they were killed by. Some people are saying Turkish forces. Some people are saying Russian forces. Uh, not sure at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, the struggle continues. Do you understand? The struggle continues. People are not happy for you know, their country, their land to be, you know, be taken so slowly. And people do believe that. You know, there's some people here, they don't have much knowledge of Islam. But they will say, you know, whoever fights for their land, then he's a shaheed and he dies doing that, then he's a shaheed. You know, so they understand this fights for his land and honor, then he's a shaheed. So, so imagine that. The simplest of people maybe don't know, you know, uh, tons and tons of Quran and hadith and etc. But they're doing, again, a service, you know, for the ummah and they're not going to let it go just like that. Yeah. And, and, and the fact is, you know, they're de- defending their livelihoods. So we, we can sit here and be judgmental of what the people are doing there. And it's very easy to do that. But the fact is, uh, you know, they have to protect themselves because there's, there's an aggression that's happening there. A uh, question I have, though, uh, Tox, is, you know, this uh, case with Turkey, um, obviously, like you said, you know, you, you do have to give credit where the fact that they are responding and other countries have done jack, like they've done nothing. Um, but, you know, they, have in, they are being pressurised by the international community uh, to deal with uh, Hayat al Sham, HDS. Um, so how is that going down with the Syrian people? Because I know that, you know, HDS is, is a, a group, collective group of lots of different movements. Um, so there's going to be people that are even that are just locals there that probably joined. Um, but if Turkey are now being asked to kind of deal with HTS, won't that, how is that being seen by the people of Syria? Is it, what, what light is that being seen in? Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't believe HTS has popular support on the ground. Um, okay. And, and okay. That's, that's important to, to understand. Um, obviously, there's other people going to have different opinions, but I, uh, the way I see it, working within the refugee camps and working with uh, you know, the normal people, I see it as that, um, most people, they would be happy with a Turkish resolution. If Turkey was to come in and administer these areas, they would uh, do that with, or, or accept that with open arms. I mean, Turkey has taken certain uh, areas. Turkey has taken certain areas and they're fully under Turkish administration, which are the, the uh, uh, ex-Kurdish areas like yeah, Afrin yeah, yeah. and Jinderis. Along the border. Uh, along the border. So them areas are being, and they're building infrastructure, they're building roads, bringing in electricity, uh, banks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Turkey has a project on the ground here as well. Um, in regards to, to, to HTS, yeah, that's a problem that Turkey, ha- it's difficult for them. Turkey, of course, uh, wants to uh, not have a conflict with the strongest power on the ground here. Um, but at the same time, they also have to understand that the West and uh, will see Hayat al Sham as a, a terrorist organization. So uh, that's, that's, that's something that they've been trying to iron out for a long time. That's something the Russians are asking of them. But again, it comes down to does uh, HGS have public support? And I think one of the reasons why they don't is because since uh, they basically fought off all the other groups, um, they basically just lost more and more and more territory. And, and that's left a 
that's left a taste in people's mouths that or mouths that you know none of these groups can be trusted and to be honest it spurred more of a popular movement again where just normal people are brandishing arms and saying look we're going to fight and we're going to yeah. just do it by ourselves so it's interesting i mean war is interesting the situation is always changing um uh, the politics is always changing the feeling on the ground is always changing uh, uh, and and that's what it feels like right now that that yeah, there is to be honest a, a new uh popular kind of movement um, where just normal people are getting up and, and saying we're going to do something about it and that's why you're seeing these sitting protests taking place that's why you're seeing stuff happening um, um, because hey Tessu Sham themselves they said recently that they can't hold all the fronts the last onslaught that came um, they, they, they ceded a lot of the fronts and they've just been handed over to normal people and normal people have you know mm. taken over them, them fronts just local communities local councils um, which is taking it back to what the revolution was like back in the beginning. Mm. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, I mean, um, we did, I did, to be honest, I didn't know about that, about HTS. I thought they were uh, quite popular on the ground, but uh, that, that's something new. I think with, the, with Turkey... They have, is... they, they have some support. They have some support. It's not, it's not, it would be in, unjust to say they don't have any support. No, they have some support. But do they have popular support of everybody? My opinion is no. Other people would say, yeah, they do. Um, but that's neither here or there, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I think with the, with Turkey, it is a situation where it's, it's a strange one because there's things that uh, you know uh, Erdogan, President Erdogan, does that uh, you think, yeah, Subhanallah, you know, he's he looks like he's breaking away from uh, from the United States. Uh, but then there's certain maneuvers that are pulled, and you're thinking, actually, was it for Turkey's own national reasons? Or so it, so it is is a bit murky. Uh, but you know. The the thing we do see is the fact that uh, it it is it is somewhat new to me that you're saying that Turkey's doing all this work in, from an infrastructure point of view because that would be strange the fact that if they're doing all that but they have no place no plans of administrating it or staying there that would be strange. Mm -hmm. They do one hundred percent. They do one hundred percent. They do. Um, yeah, this is something that a lot of people don't see. They're building a lot of infrastructure along the border, uh, along their buffer zone, and they've taken many places. So. Um, it's a it's it's a different it's a different scenario today. Turks come in and out whenever they want now, whereas this wasn't the case uh, a few years back. So you're more close to the Turkish border. I can see Turkey from outside my window. Okay, Subhanallah. <laughs> but I can't go there. But I can't go there. All right, Subhanallah. So there's Tur Turkish soldiers in in the in the area that you are you 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 currently there's, staying. There's no Turks in this actual area because they're more closer to the front lines. Mm. Um. But yeah, the front lines are not far away, bro. Idlib's very small now compared to what it was. Um, Idlib's very small. Yeah, I heard obviously uh, a few months back the, the south was taken fairly easily and large areas. Very easily, very easily. large areas just collapsed. Yeah, subhanAllah. So inshallah, I mean, um, hopefully bringing the sort of podcast to a, to a close, uh, the, the, the sole objective was to get uh, your view on the ground really, bro, because uh, a lot of times, like I said at the beginning, as Muslims, uh, certainly with the COVID stuff, you know, we can feel as if our problems, um, you know, surpass anyone else's. But it's good to get, you know, um, get, get, get an opinion and views from the ground. And, so, and especially with what you mentioned, and it was refreshing for me, which is something I always believed anyway. But, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the Muslims there, um, their resolve, you know, uh, their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, strengthens by the day. This is refreshing to hear because what this does is, this should give us, you know, those people that are not in that situation, you know, should give us that motivation that, listen, if those people are under that, you know, uh, under those issues, under that calamity, yet their iman is, 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 is strong, um, then us living in, you know, um, in a gender compared to them, you know, why is it that, you know, we are away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, you know, that's one thing that I'll be certainly using and speaking to people about and say, listen, you know, we need to, we need to get our get ourselves in order, really, because you know the thing is, is that I always say that normally you look at the people of Palestine or, or Kashmir or Syria or whatever, and we normally tend to look at them as being at a disadvantage. But the reality is, is that Subhanallah, you know, it may well be that on the day of judgment that they were certainly in the advantage, and it was us that was at the disadvantage. But you know, it's better we realize that now before it's too late. Um, so. Uh, so, Brother JK, is there any, any final points that you want to mention? 
No, I just mean, I mean, just to reiterate what you're saying, I think um, it is definitely, we, we need to continually remember what's happening around. And, you know, as Voice of the Ummah, we want to bring that voice out in terms of, it's not just uh, the UK, it's, it's the Ummah. And, and the voice from Syria, from Tux, obviously, uh, it's, it's good to hear that and understand what's what's happening. And we should always have them in our du'as, obviously, it's Ramadan as well. So, um, yes, it's a different time for us, no Tarawih, and we can reflect on ourselves, not not a problem, but don't forget the Ummah, don't forget the suffering of those in India who are being, you know, um, yeah, might accused, of, accused of, you know, spreading COVID and not being given space in the hospitals. Uh, the Yuga Muslims, they're not, you know, being forced not to fast. So we need to recognise that, yes, we have trials to an extent, but actually the situation of the Ummah is far worse, so continually remember them and understand what we need to do to change that situation. Yeah, bro. I mean, b before we go, I got one final question for Tox, man. Is uh, bro, how do you get internet there, man? <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> why, did, why didn't they just cut the internet off? You know what I mean? I'm sure the regime has got access to all the the towers and stuff. You know what I mean? It's internet from Turkey, bro. Is it from That's Turkey? Yeah, it's from Turkey. Yeah, internet from Turkey, and close to the borders, we have Turkcell as well. So we have a uh, uh, 4G internet and phones that we can use. So again, this is what people need to understand, and this is when a lot of people are critical of Turkey. Turkey has been a, a, a sympathetic border to Syria and to the Syrian uh, revolutionaries and rebels. So it's hard to put a lot of criticism on them when they've, you know, they've done a lot. Yes, yeah, so they've, made, they've made mistakes as well, but you yeah. know, we have to be fair, and and we can't be people that you know, if someone does a ma'roof or does some some good for you, you 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 know, throw it in their face because they haven't done everything. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, Brother Chucks, first of all, uh, a big jazakallah hey, really for taking your time out. You could be uh, riding the horse right now, but you've taken this time out to, to speak to us. Um, and uh, I'm actually I'm actually supposed to be going to a camp. I've got families waiting for me. We've got like iftars going on and stuff. Oh, so. subhanAllah, man. Subhanallah. No, 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 no horse riding at the moment. <laughs> well, you, you could ride your horse there, man. You get there quicker, innit? <laughs> Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> yeah, I seen, I seen a video. You, you're kicking up some speed, bro. I was quite impressed. Uh, exactly. Yeah. To you know, you know what it is. Yeah. To uh, to the beginners, it looks impressive. But people who really know how to ride horses, they're like, this guy's a terrible rider. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah, man. Subhanallah. So uh, jazakallah, her, bro, and jazakallah her for my co-host, uh, brother JK. Yeah. Jazakallah. Uh, jazakallah. We will uh, well, yeah, just, just like for having me. And if anyone wants to donate to any of our projects, let me just chuck a plug in there www.syrianeedsyou.com, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, of course. And we will put all the uh, your handles and all that sort of stuff in the uh, in the final video and podcast and stuff. So for, definitely follow Talks on Instagram. So very interesting videos he puts on and Facebook and wherever you can find him. Uh, and you'll find this podcast, inshallah ta'ala. Follow us, Voice of the Ummah, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Telegram. Uh, we'll keep forgetting these, man. YouTube, uh, we're on all, all, all the platforms. Uh, and yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so, Zakhla here, guys, and uh, stay safe. And uh, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll catch you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.